All right, so um, before I get started, um, I just want to say a few words um, um, about the organizers and about our event as well. Um, the organizers include myself. Hi, I'm Yulia Greenberg. I'm, I'm professor of anthropology and business at Drew University. Uh, Rob, um, Robert Murray, who is uh, a lecturer at Columbia Business School, is also our, one of our organizers. In addition to um, teaching at the business school today, uh, Bob is also a former advertising executive and a market researcher. And we also have Matt Arts, who is pretty much a Renaissance man. Um, among his many, many endeavors, he's the head of product and experience at Cloud Shading uh, Consulting, and he's the founder and career coach um, at a new initiative called Anthro to UX, so definitely check those out. Uh, briefly about our uh, community as well. Uh, we are the New York City um, Business Anthropology, Anthropology Salon. Um, uh, it's, it's, the, it's an event that Bob, Matt, and I started um, organizing in New York City about a year and a half ago to really start to bring together um, anthropologists local to New York City and the surrounding areas who work uh, in various fields in the private sector. Um, and until today, this is pretty much where we hosted our events um, in New York City at sunset. Um, we're not able to obviously continue our, um, meeting physically for the moment, but the past year, um, although it has challenges to think of new ways we can continue to support and to connect um, our business anthropology community, it's also created this new opportunity to meet um, via Zoom with a larger um, set of uh, practicing anthropologists and those of us who are really interested in um, broadening the impact of business anthropology community um, in, in professional settings. So we are thrilled that um, uh, Zoom has created this new uh, and novel way for us to get together as well. Um, and although we're meeting in a new format, um, our intentions for this community really remain the same, which is to continue to share experiences and resources um, so that we can help to elevate the value of the anthropology and the impact of anthropology in business settings. Um, so with those intentions being assembled, our very first, as I said, virtual roundtable um, today to discuss a familiar problem, um, how to make the case for anthropology in business. And to help lead this conversation, we're joined by a really amazing set of panelists um, to whom I'm so grateful um, that they're able to join us today. Uh, we have Autumn McDonald, who is uh, um, the owner of ABM Insights and Strategy. Um, this is a firm that utilizes mixed method approaches and integrates market research with anthropologically inspired um, insight to create greater human citricity and depth of, of understanding. We also have Ken Erickson, uh, who is faculty at Moore School of Business at the University of South Carolina, and Ken also consults um, frequently as an ethnographic researcher. Um, Susan Krasnicka is also joining us. Uh, who, she's a business anthropologist and as well as a founder of KRNI. Um, KRNI is a, is a really fantastic full service research firm that uses anthropology to help businesses to better connect with people, right? Not just with customers. And lastly, but of course not least, we have Jay Hasbrook. Um, Jay has uh, over 15 years of experience working as an anthropologist, uh, anthropologist in industry, and he's also the author of Ethnographic Thinking from Method to Mindset, um, a book I, I definitely recommend to everybody here. All right, so um, uh, our panelists, as I've said, are business anthropologists who have vast experience persuading um, colleagues and clients resistant uh, to anthropological approaches and to embrace them. Uh, thank you all so much for, uh, for joining us uh, for this conversation. And in the spirit of our New York City meetups, we'll um, open the floor to you guys until about 6.30 p.m and you'll each have uh, roughly six to eight minutes to share and talk about your experiences. Um, and we'll take questions from our large group um, at the end. 
those of you who are following this conversation at home, no need to hold your questions till then. Just feel free to enter it into chat. If you have a question, I will try to sort and elevate some questions towards the end. Uh, but at 6.30, we'll also try to um, tempt our technology gods and try to perform a minor miracle and um, attempt to um, do breakout sessions with our, with our group, hopefully without any kind of technological issues, um, where we'll invite you guys, our, um, our audience as well, to share your own experiences of making uh, the case for anthropology in your own work. As I imagine, a lot of us have really valuable experience to share as well. Um, all right, so I'm not gonna take too much time for uh, with a setup, so this is all I have to say. Without further ado, Autumn, if you don't mind, I'd love to invite you, perhaps, uh, to, start off, uh, to start us off on our conversation, and then maybe we'll ask Ken, Susan, and Jay in that order uh, to contribute as well. Does that sound good? Fantastic. Hi, everyone, and good evening. It's so nice to see all of you. I'm seeing familiar faces and new faces, so welcome to this evening's event, and thank you to our hosts and to my fellow presenters tonight. I'm really looking forward to listening and learning from all of you as well. As Yulia mentioned, um, my company, ADM Insights and Strategy, is a bit unique in that our work is what we describe as market research with an anthropological lens. Half of our team is market researchers and half of our team is comprised of anthropologists. So we're really bringing together the best of two worlds, market research and anthropology, to create win-win for our clients. And our clients come to us uh, largely from functions that are labeled as market research, or insights and analytics, or consumer insights, shopper insights. So they're very familiar with market research, but oftentimes don't know much about anthropology, don't understand the value it can bring, um, don't really know what it is, and haven't had exposure to it before. So we begin by explaining to our clients that anthropology adds unique value in terms of human centricity, and depth of understanding in the social, cultural, and emotional realm that they wouldn't otherwise be able to obtain simply via market research. And we go on to explain to them that anthropology is able to do this because of our unique emic approach, which differs from market research and its etic approach. Uh, we also explain to them that anthropology is unique in its contextual grounding and its holism. Now, the challenge we face is that most of our clients have this perception that anthropology takes a long time to do. They think it's very time intensive um, and they think that it's going to cost an extraordinary amount of money. So, you know, the host tonight had asked us to think of one specific example. And the example I have in mind is a very large multinational corporation who had asked my team and I to come in not too long ago and provide them with robust and in-depth perspective regarding their consumer target audiences. As we looked at the learning needs, we knew that this work was gonna require a variety of quantitative techniques, qualitative interviewing, and a deep anthropological analysis. As we explained this to the client, they said, great, Let's do the quantitative techniques. Let's do the qualitative interviews, but we don't really want that, quali that anthropological analysis. <laughs> they, they didn't want to lean in there. And so we needed to explain to them that it was really that anthropological analysis that was going to provide the social, emotional, cultural perspective that they were so hungry for and that was going to lead them to break through decision making. Now, the reason why they didn't want that anthropological thing that they didn't understand was again, they thought it was gonna take a ton of time and cost a lot of money. So we overcame that barrier by explaining a couple of things to them. First, we explained that we always, always as a matter of practice, our team goes about data collection in our interviews using the anthropological lens. That's simply how we do business. 
And so we made it clear to them that there would be no additional time required in the data collection. So that was the first thing, no additional time needed in data collection. We then went on to help them understand that the anthropological analysis that we were recommending was not gonna take an extraordinary amount of time. In fact, we could do the entire thing in simply one incremental week. Now, when you're dealing with multinational corporations as your clients, time matters. And so for them to hear it was only one week, that made it, um, it made it feasible for them. And then lastly, we, we addressed cost price. Again, because they have this perception, many of our clients, that anthropological work is just extraordinarily expensive, much more so than market research. And so we used a comparison to bring, make this clear for them. And that we said the anthropological analysis we were recommending really was equivalent or on par to the exact same price they would pay to do one group, one group of focus or one day of focus groups with a moderator who's not trained in harnessing deep insights. And so we said, you can either do this anthropological analysis with us or you could go and do one day's worth of focus groups with someone who's not going to get you deep insights. And so when the client understood those comparisons, no extra time for data collection, only one week for analysis, and the trade-off was deep understanding with us or a day with someone who wasn't going to give them deep understanding, it made the decision really easy and they leaned in right away. Great. I think we're going to uh, probably save questions for everybody towards the end. Um, I'm going to let everybody share some of their experiences and then we can ask you guys to respond as a group to the questions that I'm sure everybody has for you uh, in the room. Ken, um, are you here? I'm going to invite you to go ahead and get um, um, and take over, take the floor. Ooh. You know, um, we'll give Ken a few minutes to set, uh, settle in. Susan, can I ask you to step in? Yes, happy to do so. Okay. Is everything working? Can you see me? Um, yes. Excellent. Perfect. And hear me. That's good, too. Um, thank you so much for, um, for asking me to contribute uh, today to, to the organizers. I have to say that... Um, I recognized, Autumn, a lot of the ideas uh, that you were just sharing. KRNI is, I think, probably in some ways quite similar um, in, as an organization. We're a full service research company, um, but we do talk about our differentiating characteristic as being that anthropological lens, most, most certainly. And, um, and the company is us, we describe ourselves as a practice of business anthropologists. So um, we, use that, we use that concept uh, to frame our, our work. Um, I, I have to say, I recognize the concern about how long it's gonna take um, and that it'll, it'll, it would potentially extend the, timeline, extend the timeline, but I actually think the, the bigger hurdle that I've faced in my career when trying to uh, kind of sell or, or get uh, appreciation for the anthropological lens is truly just a lack of understanding of what we're really talking about here and a way to see the, the fact that the value anthropology can bring is value that will actually help them. So um, I thought about all these different examples I could share with you today. And I'm actually going to set my timer because if I don't, I'm, ter I'm terrified that I'm going to go over. So there you go, set timer. Um, so I decided I would talk about uh, this this one particular study that was that in selling it was actually really a challenge. Um, my team and I embarked upon this really ambitious year-long study of fans and fandom in 2016 and, and into 2017, and it was a syndicated study um, that we were planning to sell to the mainly to clients in the entertainment industry. Um, it was so given that it was syndicated, we needed multiple people to buy in to the study. Uh, in terms of the clients we were approaching, we ended up bringing on six different 
clients, but I only knew one of them. I had only ever worked with one of them before that I went out on this kind of, you know, pitching a cycle to, to get folks to invest in the study. And so there were all kinds of things that were making it particularly difficult. The lack of familiarity, the fact that it was syndicated and the people you're selling to are actually competitors with one another. Um, and the fact that it was ambitious and expensive um, and all of these things were gonna make it particularly challenging and it wasn't alone. There were other studies of fans in, in, in the marketplace. But I knew, um, I knew that we had something special on our hands because none of those other studies were framed, uh, really framed the idea of understanding fans and fandom from this very people-centric perspective. So when um, the very first thing I did before I started uh, even developing the pitch deck was I actually went out and interviewed potential end stakeholders. So not the research client that was ultimately going to have to green light and say yes to the research, but actually the more senior executives um, that they would consider internal clients, the CMO, the head of programming, um, the president of a network, something like that. I actually did a set of interviews with executives at that level and I um, asked them what they felt they understood well enough about fans and fandom and what they wish they understood better about fans and fandom. So I actually started the sales process with the research process, which is, you know, seems classic, seems very us to do. Um, and it was, I'm so glad we did because what we learned from doing that was that the knowledge gaps were essentially about the human side of it. It was the, it was the foundational knowledge. What actually is fandom? What does it mean to be a fan? How's it different from other forms of affinity? Um, how does it start? How, how, what makes it continue? What makes it go horribly wrong? Things like that these really basic questions. And um, I was able to take those interviewing, those interviews and the knowledge gaps that came out of it to create a really succinct pitch deck. That pitch deck that we took out there um, to sell this study started first with the business case. I didn't use an anthropological term. I didn't even raise the issue of anthropology yet. The very first thing I did was make a business case for learning about fans and fandom. And I did that based on just the market dynamics, the fact that they had been the American entertainment industry, true global entertainment industry, had been watching mass audiences shrink. It had been seeing the, and been surprised by the rise of small, very vocal um, niche audiences on the internet. And they weren't sure how to understand it. And that was a very clear, um, and acknowledged business problem. So I set the sales process, up, the argument up with their business problem first. And then from that point forward, after, after getting that initial articulation of the problem out in what I would call the language of business, I switched the minute I wrote out the objectives to what I would think of as the language of people, the language of anthropology. I wrote the objectives to, um, to to reflect the idea that we would be learning human things, um, what it means to people to be a fan, how fandom functions and operates in their lives, creates meaning in their lives, um, how it operates uh, in their social relationships, how fandom uh, spreads and reproduces socially. And if you were to read the objectives of this study, you would see very clearly that we had switched from the language of business into a much more um, kind of social science sounding vocabulary. There wasn't like, there was no term leverage in the objectives. There were um, even the, the, the term consumer appeared nowhere. It was stripped out at that point. So by the time you got from the business case set up through the research objectives, you had two languages on the table. Um, then in the part of the pitch deck where I outlined the, the design, the research design, we used five different primary methods in that study. Um, I used research methods they would recognize at least a little bit and combined it with a more anthropological interpretation of those things. So for instance, we, we conducted a full year of what Rob Kozinets calls netnography, right? Which is a, really an anthropological approach to social listening. It was written as netnography in the methodology section of the pitch deck. Um, and then it was, we explained that this would be a much more holistic approach to social, social listening. 
Um, we explained how we would do it, but see, they knew the concept of social listening quite well. They have digital agencies, they hire people to do that. What they hadn't thought about is what would a holistic approach look for? Well, that's gonna look for what are the norms in a community? What are the values they hold? What are the things that they agree upon? Where is their dissent in this community? Um, you know, those types of questions, we listed those out so they could see the unique things that an anthropological version of social listening would, would bring to this method. We did the same for what they would have recognized as diary submissions or diary work. We called it mobile ethnography. It was truly much more ethnography than simple diary work. We, we, had, we did six, uh, six month long waves of uh, field work. A hundred people each uh, in each six, every six weeks came into this method, submitted digital entries, including video, every time being a fan proved important, relevant, or meaningful in the course of everyday life. We had so much data, it was insane. We had almost 8,000 videos at the end of a year. Um, but we didn't, and we talked about it as mobile ethnography. We explained that because people were in the study for a full month, we actually got to know more about them. We got to understand their lives. Um, you know, we explained the way material culture was back then. So we, we actually, for each method, for each method, we actually explained exactly what an anthropological version, something they recognized, would bring. Um, and then we also did include large scale quantitative work. And to Autumn's point, um, I think, uh, you know, uh, having quant in the mix also made the pr prospective clients feel comfortable. Sometimes when they hear anthropology, they think it's all qualitative and that there's no relationship between anthropology and quantitative work, which of course is not the case. Um, and we did have some decidedly anthropological elements even within that survey. We called those out and we noted, this is where anthropology enters into the quantitative phase of this. And then finally, in the um, remaining methods, one of them was two, uh, were narrative analysis on two types of personal storytelling that we captured. So instead of talking about it uh, as anything else, we framed it as narrative analysis. We explained the value of hearing people tell their stories. We explained what they would learn that they wouldn't otherwise learn by capturing those stories. The last method were focus groups, which we didn't have to explain at all because they knew them, but we did do friendship and family pairs and we explained why the specific pairs we would bring in would create new value. So, um, so I, I don't wanna, uh, I know that I'm just about out of time, but I guess I would sum all this up to say that as we're out in the world trying to um, make sure that our clients understand the value of anthropology, one of the things that's been helpful for us along the way is making sure to combine the languages to, to make sure that we're speaking business effectively and then bringing in that new language of anthropology um, to, to, to marry, to join it. Um, I think that's been one of the most helpful things. It's not, we, we stretch their understanding of anthropology every time we get the opportunity to do that. And ultimately, all six of those clients are still our clients to this day. So it worked out. So that's it. I think that's it for me. Thank you so much, Susan. This was wonderful. I appreciate your, um, your experience. Uh, Jay, can I ask you to um, take the floor next? Sure. Excellent. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for um, asking me to come and talk on the panel. I, I appreciate it and uh, I look forward to um, hearing some questions as well. Um, I think a lot of what Autumn and Susan says, I would, I would plus one, as they say, in social media world. Um, definitely similar experiences. Um, but I thought one of the things that I might do in this conversation is um, stretch it a little bit, um, because a lot of the, the personal experience I have has not been about, has not concentrated at least on trying to convince clients that anthropological thinking is useful. It just happens to be the case that um, I've had luck there, I would say. Um, so they typically a client will come to me and, and even in house now that I'm at Facebook, they know sort of what they're getting into. So what I thought we might do is um, take the conversation in a slight different direction and, and talk about, well, what do you do once you're there? Um, so I wanted to open with a story um, from a project that I had a long time ago. Um, we were, I was in an agency setting and um, the team was a pretty big team and it was a very big project. I think it was eight months long. It was a really large scale project. It was like one of those future of projects. 
Um, and we had two designers, we had a historian. I mean, there was, it was a big team. And one, at about halfway through the team, you know, uh, halfway through the project rather, we had reached a point where, you know, we, we had, had felt pretty proud of some accomplishments we made and we bought a case of wine. And we're, so we had the case of wine in our project room and um, we were like, okay, so we're gonna, you know, we'll save this for the next big milestone. And, but then we started talking to one another, we're like, well, what are we gonna do with this? Because like anybody can come into this room at any time, you know, like anybody from the company or clients can come, you know, there was an open project space. Um, so we're like, well, where are we gonna, where are we gonna put this so that someone doesn't just come in here and, and, our, and take our wine? And one of the designers um, stopped the conversation briefly and then picked up a Sharpie, walked over to the box of wine and wrote user videos on the, on the top of the box of wine. And so, you know, I'm sure at that time, I probably didn't think it was that funny. Now I think it's hilarious, right? But I think that the point, the reason why I'm sharing the story is that I think in a lot of cases, we as social scientists become enamored with our own data and it, would, and it comes time to start sharing what it is that we would like to convey, we get really wrapped up in sort of what's exciting to us. And in many cases, that, that doesn't necessarily sync with, you know, what it is that people are open to receiving um, in terms of insights and, and findings. So what I found, what I've been trying to concentrate on and what I've been sharing with um, teams at Facebook and in, and in my own, previously in my consultancy is that I think it's really valuable for us to take the ethnographic lens or the social science lens and aim it inward or aim it at the team. And I know, um, Susan, you just talked about this as well, you know, interviewing stakeholders. Um, so I have a few steps that I thought I'd share that I, I found useful in, in taking that lens and helping us think more carefully about how we sync up our insights with the kinds of needs and the timing that makes sense for them and the context that makes sense for them. The first of those, I think, is um, this, this concept of just-in-time insights. One of the things I think is really easy to do when our work is to sort of, you know, think that we've got to like save everything up. We've got to make sure we've got all the T's crossed and the I's dotted and then we, have, we land this Bible in the laps of our, of our <laughs> stakeholders at the end. Um, it's not, it may not be true of, of, every, of every practitioner, but it happens. Um, and I think that we get a lot more value out of our work if we can safely and confidently substantiate what we're doing and provide those insights or bread from those insights over time. Um, and as long as, we're, as long as we're sure that we're not necessarily going to contradict ourselves later, it can be very valuable for people to start because it exposes the process for them as well and can bring them into understanding how we interpret the data that we collect. Um, and then the second thing I think is really, really useful is to um, expand our sense of empathy. So we've got um, a lot of really solid training and understanding our participants and understanding our consumers, whoever they are, or the people that we study. Um, and there's just as much value to taking that skill and aiming it toward the team that you're going to be working with, whoever it is. Thinking about them in terms of their reward structures, in terms of their values, in terms of their priorities, you know, where, where are they coming from? And, you know, who are they answering to ultimately? Or, you know, what's influencing their perspective? That'll really help, I think, in a lot of cases, get help you land your insights in the right places and the right times, because you've got a, a, a more intimate understanding. And Susan, you picked up on this exactly with the stakeholders, of course. So it's, you know, knowing them as people, basically. And then I think um, third, um, one of the things that I found is like, um, once you may have uh, sort of a, this better understanding and you have a, a better sense of timing, it's really also really valuable to think about introducing your insights as, a, as ushering a process of self-realization for them. So you're not there to teach them or to lecture them. You're there to help them feel what it is that you are trying to convey. You're there, you're there to help them Help, it's like telling a story, of course, right? It's like you're there to help them realize in their own minds what it is that you're trying to get at. So it shouldn't, the, the process and the way in which you share it shouldn't be so opaque that they just have to trust you that your interpretation is correct. It should be something that they feel and they understand and they internalize. That's not always easy, but I think it, there are ways to get there. And I think, you know, language is 
a huge part of that, you know, making sure you're not using a lot of language that's jargon and that is alienating um, to, to clients. Um, which brings me to the last one, which is, you know, thinking about shifting the dialect. Um, and Susan, I keep referencing your talk, Susan, you said you mentioned very similar things. Um, and that is, uh, you know, thinking about, I mean, of course, trying to make sure you're shifting the, the conversation away from these sort of like humanity draining terms like user, <laughs> but all, and talk about people, right? But then there's also um, a lot of benefit in changing the conversation um, from me to we term terminology. So that it's so that you're really helping them see collectivity. You're helping them seeing um, how people interrelate and the kind of influence people have on one another, not only among the the target population but also in house, right? And among themselves and and in terms of their relationship with um, you as the as the expert. And so the more you can use that term we, the more you're bringing everybody on board. Um, it really does open up the process and, and helps, I think, um, get those insights driven um, more deeply, I, I would say. Um, and then finally, um, situating your work. I agree 200%, start with the business case, always, always start with the business case. That's, that, that makes complete sense. Um, but I think it's also important to, once you get something honed down, right, in terms of a, a research brief or whatever, you, whatever, the, whatever you're starting with, um, thinking about that in terms of an elevator pitch. If you've got two sentences that you can, you can easily share with the CEO or with you know, a, a research assistant, you should be able to, both of them should be able to understand it and it should just roll off the top of your tongue. So I think that goes a long way and it helps you also process and think about how you can better communicate your findings so that they resonate deeply. Um, so with that, I mean, it's, there's a lot there. And then part of, the, part of the message here also, I think, is that um, it's not all always on us, that we should be thinking about, you know, things like platforms like this to learn from one another and, um, you know, work as teams so that we don't feel like we are solely responsible for making all this magic happen. But um, those are some things that I've found that have been helpful for me. Thank you so much, David. This is really inspiring and it's really starting me to think more and more um, about ways I could use some of your um, suggestions in my own work. Um, Ken, can I, uh, are, are you ready? I'd love to invite you to step up to the table to join sure. us. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Our virtual table, round table. Well, first, my apologies. I was stuck, stuck across town and that's my fault, but I zoomed back in time. So I'm glad to see you. So many faces here, and uh, some that I think I know. Hi, Bob. <laughs> and Inga, I don't see, but I see her picture, so that's wonderful. Um, well, give me a bit of a prompt, since I missed I missed the beginning of, of Yulia's conversation, and I just I just enjoyed listening to Jay because I think that resonates with a lot of the work that I've done. Um, one of the things for me is that I began doing this kind of work at a time when I think it was a little easier. Um, there was a time when, uh, we're talking about, I guess, the 80s and early 90s, when at least in the world of, of multinational consumer product corporations, there were not a lot of people doing ethnographic work. So once you were able to sort of find someone in an organization that had the bug, it was not that difficult to find work. Um, I would really like to hear what it's like for young, uh, emerging young professionals these days, finding clients if you're hanging out your own shingle or finding internal clients if you're inside of an organization. Because from what I've heard uh, and in conversations with others who are in both uh, practice outside working for clients and people inside large organizations doing this kind of work, that the scene has changed a little bit. Um, Ethnography doesn't, you know, you don't have a, a, a magic decoder ring. I've often said that, you know, that other folks can do this kind of work and do it very well often. But um, now there are more people doing it. And so for me, that's one of the really interesting challenges. And I know that uh, were it not for a, a well-established network of folks that I've worked with over the years, we would not be seeing projects still coming in, and we do from time to time, even though I'm in an academic setting right now. So, Yulia, where, where would you say is the most, kind of the key thing that's come out so far, and maybe maybe it's a question 
it's awkward with a group this size to to get a sense of what mm -hmm. what's the well, thing that's keep what's keeping people awake at night about all of this these what days. What I'd love for you to share with us, Ken, is maybe an experience from your example from your own experience where you had an obstinate client and who somebody who was probably might you know might have been resistant to ethnographic or anthropological methods, and you successfully were able to overcome their resistance. Well, I think I think there are two stories that come to mind. Um, uh, and, and there's there are two there are different kinds of resistance, right? There there's initial resistance to getting the work done, and if you have an advocate inside, that can help. So I'll, I have a story about that. And there's another kind of resistance, and that's resistance to the findings. Uh, that sometimes anthropologists or any ethnographer will come back with things that are unpleasant to hear, and there are some lessons from that. So let me address the first one, which is uh, what happens when folks don't get it. Uh, if you get to the point where you hear that, that means you've already got a foot in the door, that somebody's invited you in to, to maybe make a pitch or proposal or do something. So um, I remember the first time we did some work with, um, well, this was interesting because this was a connection from some work that we did earlier. If you do a piece of work and someone in industry moves on to another place, they may call you up again. You know, if you make make those uh, make those relationships strong enough, or if you're just lucky, which I think we were. So it, we, uh, it, it, we let me give you a little context. We are a small group of four or five uh, ethnographers, one designer at the, at that point, one designer and um, a, a sociologist, uh, Joe Young, who's now uh, who was most recently at Exxon, although she's not right at the moment, um, and. Um, let's see, well, a couple of other folks. And, and we have a small ethnographic research boutique shop. And we were invited by a former client who had moved to another uh, business category uh, where they were the director of consumer insights. And we were brought in to discuss the proposal that he had hired us to do, which was essentially in-store research, trying to answer some questions about, some pretty nitty gritty questions about uh, uh, kind of, uh, in store, you know, how do people shop for their product? Essentially, I mean, it involved packaging, it involved assortment, it involved a lot of a lot of things. So, we had not worked for him in that context before, and so we were in a conference room, and people began to ask the kinds of questions you'd expect. How can you generalize from such a small sample? You're only going to be talking to X number of people. Um, uh, and in that case, we were doing uh, in store. Uh, intercept interviews, observation, and in-home work, and following people from home to the store. We were kind of, which was sort of a standard thing for us when we did consumer research. We were doing a lot of this kind of itinerary method. Go to the place where you can see people talking about the product, thinking about to go shop for the product, and, you know, hang out with them while they're shopping for the product, and then maybe follow them home and find out what happens later. So we, we followed that. And uh, we had quite a discussion in the boardroom with several uh, mucky mucks in this co company that were saying, ah, oh, we're not really sure about this methodology. And what happened that was interesting was that the person who had hired us stood up and became our advocate and said, you guys have to understand that exploratory research is different than confirmatory research. Uh, and the, the real delight for me was to hear him feedback some of the things that we had said to him in another context when he was working for another company. And one of the things that I like to use as a catchword is a way to explain this, uh, uh, this concern about sampling and sample size and so on is, is to make that distinction between uh, being in a, a, a learning context or being in a testing context. That if you know the landscape, then you can go ahead and do testing and you can talk about hypotheses and you might want to talk about a larger sample and maybe confirming this with a larger group of people and you know doing a little bit of quant in addition to whatever quant we always do as part of our ethnographic work we still count stuff you know? and he stood up and he said those things he was saying exactly the things that i had said to him before and he'd heard us say in, in prior presentations and it was kind of delightful because he he shut down that conversation and he said for for him understanding what people are doing in context helps him get better ideas to solve problems in the company right so 
I was just, I was pretty much flabbergasted. So I guess the takeaway from that is that you can build kind of advocates inside an organization who can help you address the issue of people who are, who are resisting kind of what's happening. And later on, you know, we, we came to do additional projects with this, with this organization and, and folks kind of got the idea of how this works. And uh, that was kind of a nice thing. He's somebody that he, later he moved on to another group and said, we don't want anyone doing focus groups in my team. He had a team of four or five consumer researchers. He says, I don't want focus groups. I want ethnography or at least in home interviews. And he knew the difference between those two. So that's the first story, right? Uh, the second story um, is, was a real wake up call for us as a small shop. And I, I don't know how many of you are in, in this situation where you're, you're working in teams of one or two people and hanging out a shingle and doing your own thing. But one of the things that we discovered is that it is really important to be exceptionally clear about who owns the data and who owns the report. And those can be two different things. And we ran into a problem that came out of some, again, in-store research that we did. And this was for a major multinational company that had a pet food division. And we went into a variety of different uh, retail settings in which the product was sold. And we went in with our cameras and we went in with our interviewers and so on. And uh, we uh, video, uh, we, we had, this was in the days of tape, I'm showing my age, this wasn't digital. Uh, at the time in one of these venues, and this was actually in feed and seed, which is a term of art in the world of pet food retail, feed and seed, big box retail, veterinary, and then there's a uh, small mom and pop, I guess. Anyway, we're in a feed and seed store and in, in walks uh, a young woman to buy her uh, looking for dog food. And she's interested in something because that has chondritin in it because she has a dog that has joint problems. So she begins looking around and she has this conversation with a gentleman who is there representing a competitive product, not the one we were working for. I don't know if it was Eucanuba, but it was one of those natural kind of dog food products, right? So this guy is hired as a contractor by Eucanuba, which is something you see in a lot of retail settings. And he's talking to this woman about, well, that's good that you're interested in chondritin if your dog had especially bigger dog and so on and joint problems, but you shouldn't buy it's been a long time I can say who it was, shouldn't buy science diet because science diet doesn't use natural products and blah, blah, blah. And he had a lot of reasons why it was maybe not best for her to choose science diet. And we had this on video. And we brought this back along with some other things. And we heard two things from this group, which included some very smart, wonderful, caring, compassionate veterinarians who we, we felt uh, uh, were really digging what we were doing. And there were also a couple of folks who were kind of grumpy about what they were seeing on the screen when we played this video. The first thing they said to us was, this young woman is not our client. That's not our customer. And it's like, well, they were in the store looking to buy your product. Well, not our customer because she had on tattoo, she was tattooed and she was not in the right demographic because they were stuck on their segmentation, which is a whole nother issue that we often run into as ethnographers. Segmentations break down in the face of reality over and over again. Anyway, so that was the first problem. We kind of sorted that out. And the next thing they said after they were had sort of digested this bit, they said, and by the way, we want to get a hold of your video because uh, you know, that guy was lying about our product. And uh, the, the discussion around the table continued and began to escalate. Uh, we want that video because we're going to use that video to sue this other company, which is sending people out into stores to lie about our product. Uh, yeah, and that was interesting. Uh, well, uh, actually, we did not have a line in our contract at that time that said, we own the data and you own the report. And that became actually important later with another project where a similar, not exactly the same thing happened, but when, when a client later said, we'd really like to have your raw video, right? So our response to this conflict, to this pushback from, or push in a weird direction from a client was to say, look, we have confidentiality responsibilities here to the people that we've learned from, to the people in the store, the guy working in the store and this, this customer of yours who is in fact your customer or potential customer. 
And we think it's also a bad idea from a management perspective and a bad idea from a marketing perspective. And can we kind of shift this conversation to someplace else? And it wasn't easy to do, but we were able to kind of dodge that bullet. And as a result of that, made sure that in all, all of our contracts with any, anyone we did work for, we specified very clearly who owns the data and who owns the report. Uh, which becomes, you know, an important thing to say. We, we, uh, I drew on it. There's a guy named Don Stoll, who was one of my professors at, at university, and he, he has written a lot about collaborative research in, in health settings, primarily, and talks a lot and has written about a thing called a team compact. Well, we sort of took his idea of a team compact, which specifies the, the obligations that you have as an anthropologist or an ethnographer with the other team members. You know, we're going to share our data with one another. That maybe we can publish stuff later because it's important to build uh, this practice that we're doing. And we, we sort of took some of that language and built it into a contract so that we, uh, we could say, you know, you own the final research product, we own the data. And by the way, if we want to publish methodological things, we'll let you know first, but we reserve the right to do that. So uh, Ken, building that into the know, Ken, thing was the thing. about two minutes and then we're going to have to move on. I'm Next done. Question. That's it. That was the two examples. So thank you. Good. Thank, thank you so much, Ken. This is really important and valuable advice, especially for us as anthropologists. Of course, publishing and consulting are two ways in which we can continue to elevate our role. So that's really actually a useful strategy for continuing to um, exercise some kind of control over our own um, work in this in this area. Um, so thank you so much to our panelists. You know, I think you started us off in a really fantastic conversation. I've, I wish we had five hours and not just uh, one hour in which to ask you uh, more questions, but I, I'm aware of the time. Um, I think we're going to try to um, still fit in some networking in the back end, but uh, first I want to open up um, the floor to some questions. I know there's been a, a really active discussion in chat and a lot of you might have questions that you're just interested in asking as well. So maybe I'm, uh, I'll just invite um, those of you who are in the room with us right now just to speak up and ask a question to the panelists that you might have. Well, so you, this Matt, um, we have some questions already in the chat that I can, that I'll, uh, I'll throw out there. So. Um, we have a question from Imani for Susan and Autumn, and the um, question is, would you agree or disagree that your clients are hostile, um, maybe a sh it could be a strong word, but hostile towards anthropology, or is it less hostility and more suspicion, or is it a lack of respect for anthropology because it's not big data? Do you want me to take it, Susan, or do you want to go first? Uh, that's so funny. I was muted, of course, and speaking. Why don't you go ahead, Autumn, and I'll chime in as well. So I, I wouldn't say it's hostility. I would say it's lack of familiarity and understanding. Um, so that would be my overarching answer is lack of familiarity and understanding. And so part of our job is to help them, under, help them comprehend what they get. What is the value add? of anthropology, what does anthropology uniquely bring? Now that said, um, I do think, and I, I'm perhaps biased because I spent two decades of my career on the client side in insights, analytics, um, and market research functions at companies like, I was at Procter & Gamble, Colgate Palmolive, Kraft, Revlon, Hershey, so I am biased. I do think it's very important to go through that exercise speaking in the client's language so that it's clear and persuasive to them. Um, I would say that there is one watch out and I share this in a spirit of candor with all of you. Um, you may not agree with it, but again, someone who's coming from the client side, there, there are some feelings about ethnography. Uh, so while when it relates to anthropology, that's an unknown that people are unfamiliar with. I would say, however, that ethnography is in a bit of a different place and there are certain perceptions about ethnography that in some ways um, have opportunity to be overcome on the client side. Yeah, that, it, that's interesting. I, um, I agree with that. I, I don't find hostility or I don't find hostility toward the idea of bringing an anthropological lens. If anything, 
I find it is often considered kind of this interesting thing that, oh, it might be a special secret sauce that they've got over there. Wouldn't that be great if we could have some of it? I don't feel I fight it, but we don't just sell ethnography. That is absolutely true, Autumn. We don't. We are a full service research firm. And, uh, and so I don't feel like I have to create, and I don't feel like I have to create strong arguments for a single method. Um, and that pr the overall perspective is actually not that difficult to, uh, I think, to um, gain appreciation for. Uh, and I think you're 100% right. It's about communicating the unique value it's going to bring and being able to do so, being able to use the language they already have, the vocabulary they possess, and pair it with those anthropological ideas so they can say, oh, great, I'll learn this thing if we bring an anthropological lens to the table that I wouldn't otherwise be getting. I think it's really that that's, that's kind of the, the heart and soul of the matter. I, I, I agree. I think it's completely the opposite. I think anthropology is actually considered uh, a little bit alluring and interesting, and they like the idea of bringing some uh, bringing research back to their internal stakeholders that is just a little different, perhaps um, even teaching or sounding or um, bringing ideas to the fore that they wouldn't otherwise have gotten, and that uh, that as the internal kind of champion for that fresh perspective, they get the credit for doing something new and innovative. So I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. That's, I don't feel like I fight it. Great, thanks. Um, okay, we have another question from Kristen. How do you, and this could be for anybody out there, any of the four speakers, how do you think about the difference between business anthropology and design thinking? Have you run into confusion around this in your work? Jay, is that maybe something you could take? Yeah, I'll run with this one. Um, I do think that there is confusion for sure. And I, and I think that a lot of it is, you know, we've seen um, a lot of disciplines take on ethnography as a method um, because it's a useful tool. And, and design is certainly one place where in, in the course of human-centered design, they see that as part of the process. Um, and I think that, um, where I found it to be useful to make a distinction, and it isn't always useful to make a distinction, but where I have, it found, where I have found it to be the case is when you start leaning on theory a bit more and you start thinking more specifically when you're moving from behavioral insight to something that's, that's a bit more about cultural insight. Um, and, that, and in that case, you don't see as much of that in design thinking and you do see more of it in business anthropology because we're bringing, a, I would say, a, a greater share of the discipline's, um, you know, theoretical um, background to the, to the engagement. So I think that's useful. And actually, um, to build a little bit on um, what Susan was saying, I think that in some cases that that feels a little bit more sort of magical in some ways for some people because they're getting, you know, some insight that they that they maybe didn't anticipate. It isn't. Um, it isn't um, perhaps so obvious to them to see connections between behavioral patterns because like they, like they might be if we keep it at that level. So um, th there is some value to going in that direction, I would say with the caveat uh, without the jargon. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Anybody else? All right, then I have another one for, again, any, any of the four presenters. Um, so a couple of you have touched on, and this is a question from Ethan, a couple of you had touched on price, the price of research. So how do you discuss the value or profit um, sort of return dynamic uh, of the investment being made? How do you know, maybe how do you justify that the work? Honestly, I'll, I'll say I don't. I had a client, uh, I had a client just a couple of weeks ago tell us that we were more expensive than like anyone else that had the, I don't know, she'd received a similar proposal from for a while. And it was a really interesting moment. I, I haven't had to defend the cost of our work. And I, I find that we, we I, don't, I don't find myself having to do that very often. And when she kind of questioned it, I was taken aback. 
And, uh, and I, you know, I, I, I just first made a real attempt not to get defensive. That was the very first step. And, and then the, the next, the next step for me was to say, okay, I, I understand that this may be more expensive than what you've been paying for, for other types of research in the past. Um, all I can, all I can say is that in addition to the actual primary research, the methods, the execution, the reporting that everything that's listed here, we are also bringing um, we are bringing our experience and our subject matter expertise and our um, methodological expertise to bear. And we believe that that difference that you're seeing is held within that, it, it, that it falls within that value. Um, and it, I don't know exactly how it happened, but I will say that she, uh, she said, Oh, I see. So it's almost like there's a cons there's almost like a consulting fee that's baked in, and I remember thinking, uh, what an interesting kind of maneuver she just made. That there's some sort of that there's anthropological consulting. There was also fandom expertise consulting, and that that was how she thought about it. But I I don't find that we are so uh, I don't find us talking about price uh, all that often. Uh, generally, once the clients have an understanding of the work that we do, if what it's going to cost to do the work the way we do it is more than they can afford for any given project, we look for ways to scale back scope. And uh, But I don't find a whole lot of, I don't find it's particularly helpful once you've explained the value anthropology brings to argue too much about price. I guess that's what I would say. Oh, can I weigh in here? Because I have a slightly different view. Sure. <laughs> and sure. again, maybe my view is different because I spent two decades on the client side. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my clients tend to engage with us very candidly and openly yep. and letting us know their budgets. Um, and they will say very clearly, you know, Autumn, here, you know, we have conversations about the learning objectives, the indicated business actions, again, because it always starts with a business need. And they will say, here's what we have. What can you do with that? And then we'll engage in very collaborative conversations, again, because our work is oftentimes mixed methods, in discussing different ways in, you know, and those different ways in may be, you know what, we can do a quantitative survey with a sample of 50 per week versus 100 per week. And with that, we can do this kind of in-depth, one-on-one qualitative interviews. We can do this kind of online, observational, qualitative. But we, we talk through with them the pros and cons of those different ways in and the different types of learnings that would be achieved through each. And then we talk about then from each of those different types of learnings, what can be done from a business standpoint. But we engage extremely collaboratively and very openly and transparently in uh, pricing, financial, and budget conversations with our clients. Yeah, and I, I don't want to, we do too, automatic. And that conversation, how much do you really have to work with here is almost always the starting point for sure. Um, it was, this was a, this was the only time I've had this happen in, I don't even, probably my entire career where someone really pushed back on price. And it was a client we hadn't worked with before. It was a first time client, so we didn't have the relationship that gave us that starting point, that open conversation about what, you know, what, are, what you know, we knew that we knew the, the basic request for the business goals uh, and what the, and the knowledge gaps, but we didn't have that kind of relationship. But I 100% agree that, that that process you just described is the one that most, most frequently unfolds. Yeah. Okay, so I think we probably have about five more minutes and then we want to maybe get to the networking portion. I'm going to try to combine a couple questions here and um, Ken, this also relates to something you said. So there's a few questions about like, you know, how would you describe what business anthropology is to somebody who doesn't know? There's a related, kind of a related question of like, how might you get into business anthropology? And then um, maybe another one yet, like how do you go about finding clients? So like, you know, this could be for maybe somebody who's worked who's looking to get in as a practitioner in an organization, or maybe somebody who's looking to start their own practice. But 
does do any of you have maybe some suggestions of you know how to sort of pitch the value of anthropology and and maybe find a job or or start a practice and find clients you know aside from things that you've said thus far? Let me let me. Uh, I, I noticed that there was a question in the in the chat about uh, getting started, and this person was uh, indicating that they're an archaeologist, uh, and I think. Uh, one of the things that I like to say to archaeologists is you're already in the house when it comes to consumer products because you care about material goods and things and you have some theoretical knowledge about that. So doing the ethnography, it's a matter of getting your feet on the ground and getting a client. I often tell people starting off that the, the first thing you need is not a website and a business card. The first thing you need is a customer. You know? And finding that um, means networking a lot and that's what kind of happened with me, but once you have a first customer and you have a job under your belt, then it's a matter of uh, finding settings where you can be with lots of people who are interested in the work that you do. So finding your local AMA, your American Marketing Association, your whatever local business clubs you can find or groups. And also there are national meetings in which uh, people get together and share marketing research ideas. There are downloaders out there who put on conferences. We don't know what's going on this year. It's probably online if it's happening at all, but um, places like the Institute for International Research, fancy name for a downloader that works in different business verticals and puts on two, three, four, five different conferences a year. They are producers. They look for people to come in and, and talk. So that's uh, two ideas that may or may not be helpful. Yeah. Did anybody else? I know that um, when I got started, one of the in, in consulting specifically, um, one of the things that was really useful was having an anchor client, having a client that has, you know, some pretty beefy needs um, that you can dig into. Maybe there are two or three different um, sort of lines of inquiry that you can explore. Um, really helps you, you know, have that kind of nest then that that you can work from and reach out from there. I, I, that was a case of luck, I think, more than anything. But it is useful to have. To jump into an industry and be like, is it healthcare or technology or whatever? Um, and to add to what Ken said, I think it's useful to, in addition to networking within, you know, others who are doing similar types of research, it's useful also to network, you know, outside of that of that zone as well. Move outside your comfort zone, you know, attend some conference that you know nothing about, you know, medical equipment or whatever it is, um, and and really get a sense of what their needs are. It can go a long way. And Jay, since you're now you're, since you're now on the inside, any maybe thoughts on how somebody could you know potentially uh, you know transition to a large organization like you have? Sure. Yeah. Um, one of the things I think is uh, important about I mean, I, a lot, many of us have gone back and forth. Um, Autumn, you shared <laughs> similar experience. Um, yeah, I think that one of the things that's important um, in terms of shifting back to an in-house role is thinking about the strategic relevance of what it is that we're doing and what is it that we offer um, so that we're plugging in in places that you might not expect in the consulting mode. So you might you might take a set of insights and, and whatever, reuse them, recycle them, I don't know what it is, that what you'd say, but thinking about where they might apply to different portions of a development process, whatever that may be. Um, so it really helps to be able to be flexible with how it is that you can communicate about the value of our work um, to dif in different, um, from different perspectives in the organization. All right, well, we are at 6.40. Um, so you, do you wanna maybe set up, set up the breakout rooms? Yes, so thank you so much once again to our panelists. Um, this has been a really great conversation as always. Um, it feels like it's just the beginning. Um, if anything, this conversation really shows that there's no one way of making a case for anthropology in business. There are so many different ways to create success, both for anthropology and for our business partners. Um, and the ideas shared today show a range of uh, ways for getting started and continuing success. So thank you so much for your experiences and for your willingness to share these thoughts with us. Um, that said, um, this is just the beginning. Uh, our conversation is only getting started. Bef uh, before I set everybody up in a breakout room, I just wanted to mention a couple of things to conclude. Um, one thing to know about if you're really interested in continuing uh, being part of our community, 
is, uh, and I'm going to share the screen for just a minute. Um, can you see the business anthropology? Yes? Okay, great. So one way in which you can continue to engage with business anthropology more generally is through the business anthropology community online, uh, conveniently located at businessanthro.com. Um, this is a community that's larger, just our New, uh, New York City meetup. Um, there are events taking place uh, regularly, um, even yearly conferences, uh, but it's also a platform that collates different kinds of thinking around this topic. Um, so this, is, this website offers a plethora of resources and uh, webinars and um, additional kind of tidbits to think with. And of course, our local uh, meetup will continue is, is thinking ahead for 2021. Um, we're thinking of uh, a set of uh, kind of a new series that we'd like to um, produce uh, hopefully eventually physically, but also virtually. And we're planning to stream um, our events in the future for those of you who are not able to join us in New York. Um, Matt, do you wanna say just a couple of words about the survey you created to um, invite people to comment on the kinds of ideas we have um, thought about for future events, um, express your interests, and also share some of your own ideas for what you'd like to see in these kinds of forums. Yeah, sure. So it's, it's a very brief survey. It would take you all of two minutes. Um, I think it's maybe four questions max, and there's only one that's required. But basically, you know, we have a proposed 2021 theme, uh, three panels uh, that we are roughly kicking around the idea of. We'd love to get your feedback. Um, you can, you know, give us uh, feedback on the three that we've proposed, as well as propose your own, propose speakers if you have anybody in mind that you think would make a great speaker. Uh, and that can include yourself, so please don't be shy. So we'd love to hear from you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next one, um, and hopefully in person. But we also have some breakout rooms coming up for networking. So thanks. Great, thank you so much. And can you share that last link again in the chat for those? Oh, yeah, it's sorry. just in there. Yeah. All right. So um, if you are able to, if you still have the time, stick around for a quick chat. We're going to try to perform some uh, Zoom trickery and split everybody up seamlessly and without issues. Um, one suggestion uh, you might want to take up in your smaller group is to continue this conversation and share your own experiences. So maybe discuss some ways you have advocated for anthropology in your own work, or perhaps if you have not had the chance to, how you might want to uh, do that in the future or see a better way to do that if you've already done the work. Um, it's not mandatory. You're welcome to just uh, get to know each other, introduce, introduce yourselves, but um, Hopefully this could be one way um, to continue this conversation, um, to take this conversation further. So let me try to arrange this one second. Those of you who um, are not able to stay, feel free to jump off. Otherwise, I'm going to now.